All right, so today I'm with my friend who's, I think, since seven years old, maybe? Yeah, each other, around that time. Which is pretty crazy. Nick Gold, also known as Goldie, not the drum and bass DJ, though. <laughs> and uh, Nick's had a very successful career in advertising. He's a big Arsenal fan and did a campaign with Thierry Henry, which I think was a bit of a dream Dream job, you. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now, interestingly, more on, like, Cosmic Bridge-type top content, he runs a podcast called Yogis and touches on things that we talk about a lot in the show related to like men's mental health. Yoga, I don't think we have actually talked about, although it comes up uh, a lot on the show. When you keep stuff locked in and when you don't talk about it, it builds up and it builds up and it becomes, yeah. it, can even, it can even become a physical issue as well. Yeah, yeah. But often that mental build up just makes life feel so much harder than it is. And I would say about three or four years into practicing yoga, I first started to experience it becoming more of a mental practice. And what yoga allowed me to do was really control my monkey mind, my thoughts and my emotions. Everything became a lot clearer. When you become a dad, you have a kid, it's like life changes like nothing else. Nothing else can come close to it, at least what I've experienced in life. And a kid having a kid is the hardest work you'll ever have but also enriches life in in a way like no other i think to start with what could be cool is explain like what yogis is and why you actually set up the podcast yeah cool All right thanks it's good to be here <laughs> happy to be having this conversation and definitely get into yoga and many other topics so yogis i i guess what we'd, i'd call it is a space for men to work on their mental emotional and physical health the reason why it started uh, it actually originally started as yoga for men before it became anything and then after kind of talking the, through the idea with a couple of mates that i was starting with it kind of felt that it should be bigger than that and it was it was during the time near the beginning of the uh during covid which actually feels like a lifetime away now and it was just about men and vulnerability and how we find it hard to talk about things. And I think as someone who, when I was growing up, I mean, we went to the same school, an all boys school. Yeah. You know, if you talked about how you felt, it was called, you know, you were called names that were not nice uh, and derogatory. And yeah, so we were kind of never encouraged to talk out. and. I wouldn't say I was a, a hypersensitive or hyper emotional person, but yeah. I definitely felt like emotional and I felt like I was keeping lots of stuff in, which only after getting into yoga, which we can get on in a bit, I kind of learned the importance of being able to talk about how we're feeling, yeah. different emotions that we have. So the long answer to why we set up yogis was to try and encourage men to talk more and look after their physical, emotional and, and mental health. It's, got, it's always holistic for me when we talk about health. So that's why I kind of mention all three they're all interlinked but it was just about to encourage men to talk more yeah and why specifically men as well i think as a man myself it felt like it was something that men struggle to talk about more yeah i have female friends in my life that it's, it's always been much easier to talk about how i'm feeling go deep about certain topics um different moments in my life that have caused certain behaviors with women, it was always much easier to engage with them about it. And I felt yeah. like it was a safer space. Could I could look at them like we're looking at each other now and talk to them about it and not feel ashamed or feel scared or feel judged. Whilst definitely in late teens, early 20s and mid 20s as well, I think some of those conversations, if I was having with men, even if it was friends, I don't think I felt comfortable to do it. And I was just very aware that the space didn't exist for men and none of us were having those conversations yeah. so i guess that's why i was focusing specifically on on men yeah, yeah interesting as well because i know someone who's been on your podcast who was on the cosmic bridge as well as will castle mm. and he was talking about how i think it's the number one killer of young men in the uk is suicide which obviously mm. is related to like mental health problems but it's it's for men versus women and it's probably a lot to do with what you're talking about right um, yeah totally i i Look, suicide, it's a very complex thing and there's a lot going on in someone's life yeah. to, to get them there. But certainly one thing, and this is just from discussions that we've had on the on the podcast that we do, but also just generally kind of speaking to other men within the community and, and speaking to other men who are part of the yogis community as well, is that 
when you keep stuff locked in and when you don't talk about it, it builds up and it builds up and it becomes, yeah. it, can even, it can even become a physical issue as well. Yeah, yeah. But often that mental build up just makes life feel so much harder than it is. And there were a few people that we've spoken to on Yogi's, kind of someone who was on one of our, one of our films that we did, who'd been part of Yogi's community from the beginning, from up north, had never really met him. And he kind of said that hearing other men talk about the issues that we were talking about on Yogi's actually played a role in helping him not take his own life, which I think wow. was something that felt just really proud to hear it, to be honest, but also just the importance of other men knowing that we're all going through some sort of shit. And a lot of the time we're going through similar stuff, whether that be relationships, parents, financial pressures, a lot of the stuff yeah. we men feel we're feeling some very similar things. So I think the more we're talking about this in the open, it's like with Deli Ali's interview as well recently, the more that is talked about in, in the open, the more it's talked about, whether that be high profile, like something like that, or just on a level that me and you have a conversation yeah. with other mates as well, it encourages people to talk, talk more and more. Yeah. I think, because one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was like, where's the line in terms of like oversharing as an example and i think um because what you're talking about i think a lot of men don't share at all right mm. which is not good right but then there's also a line of i think a lot of people share too much potentially on social media nowadays and I, i've heard this term like sad fishing as an example which is like <laughs> you know essentially like looking for likes on social media maybe you're not even that sad right but you're just trying to like mm. get attention on, on social media um so i think there's there's like a line so i guess when it comes to your podcast and yogis in general where when do you think is like what do you think are some of the issues people aren't talking about that they should be talking about so first of all i think the sad fishing did you call it yeah <laughs> that's a really good term i would say one of the things that has become quite clear is that in the mental health space there is a um commodification of that space and i think no. people are looking like people do everywhere there's chances everywhere and people are trying to exploit mental health to make money and yeah. i think we we are aware 100%. sad fishing there there are lots of people and organizations doing this and i think when it's done with that intention you can kind of see through it a lot of the time but i think that's when oversharing or kind of other ways of exploiting it are are definitely negative I, I do think at the end of the day, if there is a space that someone feels safe sharing and they're doing it with the right intentions, so not to get more likes or not to yeah. get an extra buck, I, I don't think there is anything, I don't think you can overshare if you're doing it with the right intentions. Yeah. And it's more when you try to exploit it, I think that's when, that's when no one's really getting anything authentically yeah. from it. So it's all about the the intention behind it. If, it. if the intention is attention seeking, right? That's not a good intention. But if it's, I wanna help other people who are going through a similar situation, or I'm in a very bad place myself, right? But I, I would like, like support from my friends. Because again, the sharing part, it's not going on social media necessarily. It's just even yeah. talking to your wife or husband or like whoever it is, right? Um, yeah, exactly. And, and to take the Delhi Ali interview, and you know, he's a Spurs player, someone who, you know, I don't know. <laughs> afraid to say I hated for many years just because of who he played for but you listen to that interview and it is very raw it is very emotional and he is he is sharing a lot yeah if there was someone who was doing it for the wrong reasons you could very much say that that interview was oversharing and he was potentially yeah. doing it for likes he was maybe doing it for um from a PR perspective and I think people do do it yeah from a PR perspective and there's um a big big podcast that I will not name but I feel that some people that go on this big podcast do overshare for likes because yeah, it is yeah. one of the biggest in the UK, one of the biggest in the world. And I feel that each time a guest comes on, there's a big sob story. Yeah. And I think some of them are authentic, but I do think some of them are exploiting that platform, yeah. exploiting the mental health space so that they are humanized as celebrities. And, and maybe I'm, I'm uh, jumping to conclusions there, but it's just a feeling that I get. Yeah, hundred percent. I thought maybe I'd give a couple of examples that made me. I never really thought about this sad fishing thing before, but actually, there was a guy, the footballer Kevin. What was his second name? Who was on your podcast? Kevin George. Kevin George. Yeah. So he was on your podcast, 
and he was he was actually you were talking about this topic as well like mm. where's the line so like being a man because masculinity like old school masculinity can be good in a certain way where if someone's trying to rob your house you like defend it that's not the time to start like crying and like spilling your heart yeah. out to your wife right so a lot of it's like timing so that was one example that i thought was quite mm. interesting and then there was another guy we had on the show um felix cock and his um he shares a lot of mental health content he actually runs a, a mental health business as well but he was saying again if you run a business if there's a crisis during that crisis you can't be the one who's like having a breakdown like you've got to be the mm. leader in that situation so i think there are certain times where I guess timing is important is what I'm saying here with the like oversharing and like being vulnerable as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I would call it timing and I'd also say find the right space to do it. Yeah. And that's kind of the same thing as timing. Like if the house is burning down, that's not the right space to yeah. then have, you know, talk about your teenage traumas with your wife <laughs> whilst the house is burning down. And, and also in the same way that if, uh, let's say we're watching like a football match with 10 mates at the pub and kind of everyone's there watching the footy then isn't the time as well yeah. to go really deep into something like be vulnerable about something from your childhood or, or whatever yeah, yeah. it is so I think it's it's timing but I think it's more about the space and, I, and yeah. when it comes to mental health that space to be able to express yourself especially as a man yeah is super important so for me it's it's t timing but more do it in the right space yeah, of yeah. which timing is a part of that which reading the room as well you know like you, people have got got to be receptive to it as well and and the God, i think one of the worst things that can happen is when a man finally decides to be, be vulnerable he does it in a space where it's really hard to be vulnerable because people aren't there to meet him yeah, yeah. and then that person will then shut down again for another 18 months five years or whatever it is so it's about identifying and being aware yeah. of when is the right time but also what what is the right space to, to be yeah. vulnerable. So I mean, try and get tactical here. Let's imagine, you know, maybe you want to talk about something that you kept to yourself. You're a man, like you said, you've you've done that thing of keeping it to yourself. You don't feel good. As you said, it's got emotional impact, but maybe physical impact as well. What advice would you give people, even of just like speaking to a loved one, a partner or a family member? Like, how do you go about doing that? I think different for everyone, but I would say, find a space that you're comfortable in and it doesn't mean a physical space it might no. mean that like mikey let's go for a let's go for a walk in the park you know and then yeah. we're not looking at each other in the eyes and what we found <laughs> is men don't like looking each other in the eyes and being vulnerable yeah. they like side by side communication whilst yeah. women will sit opposite each other at the table men like to be side by side so that could be going for a run together it could be going for a walk in the park yeah it could be playing fifa do you know what I mean? You're playing FIFA, you're staying at a screen, but you still have time to talk about things that otherwise, yeah. and because the kind of the concentration's a little bit on FIFA, it kind of weirdly opens up this space where people are a bit more comfortable and you know, you can shout, you know, never should have been a goal, whatever it is as well. So so I think for me, find the space that you feel comfortable in, find, and that that's the environment and also the person as well. Yeah. And if you can find that space, then just, just start talking and the hardest yeah. thing is to start talking as soon as you start it's like when you do a big presentation or a speech yeah you're most nervous about the first five words but as soon as you start you just go into it and you just you can keep going and then it will flow so because the two biggest pieces of advice i'll give is one find the right space and environment yeah. whatever you're most comfortable in and two especially for men that might not be looking each other in the eye don't make a big thing of it <laughs> and two um what was the second one? Uh, Find the right person. Right, right space. space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't remember the second one, but the um, main one is the space. So we mentioned at the start with yogis, obviously it, it's kind of evolved into the like men's mental health thing. But then you also said at the start it's meant to be a yoga thing. And I think your journey with yoga is quite interesting because you had a bad back, right? And that's how you mm. got into yoga. And I think you said before that was a bit of your cosmic bridge because that was very much the start of your spiritual journey as well. Yeah, yeah. The second point was just talk. Don't don't keep it in. Just go for it. Okay. But yes, yoga de definitely, um, definitely. I guess what you call my cosmic bridge. So when I was twenty one, twenty two, I got diagnosed with kind of quite a major spinal injury. And before then, I was playing a lot of football, a lot of sport, football at least two or three times a week going to the gym a lot lots of physical exercise cycling everywhere running a lot 
and I had a what the surgeon said was not a Mickey Mouse injury and it was quite a serious one and I got told I can never play football again never run again and it was tough to take yeah I did a lot of physio about 18 months of physio and then started gradually uh, kind of doing more activity and one of the things I started doing was yoga because as a physical activity I was told it'd be very good for my spine and my back yeah and I, I carried on with the yoga for a few years I'd say three or four years I was doing it quite a lot four or five times a week and as a physical practice it felt good for my back and I started playing football a little bit of it because my back yeah, just yeah. my spine was getting stronger and, and healthier and I would say about three or four years into practicing yoga I first started to experience it becoming more of a mental practice and it was a massive switch in in how I viewed yoga and I would say I first became aware of it is I had what I you know what we call a monkey mind like jumping around everywhere the whole time yeah. And what yoga allowed me to do was really control my monkey mind, my thoughts and my emotions. Everything became a lot clearer. I had a lot more clarity in, in my life. So as I'm saying, after about three or four years, it became more of a mental practice. And that's when it became very serious for me. And for the years after that, it became a dedication, a, a very serious practice that I was practicing five, six times a week. I'd go to India for a few months every year to practice every day, three or four hours of yoga a day. And it became a massive part of my life and not just physically was I feeling very healthily healthy but mentally as well it did so much for me and first of all it was controlling the monkey mind yeah and then the second thing it started to do it's that and you know you talk about through some of the breath work that you do as yeah. well is some of these other things these patterns that I had some of my shadow self some of that was becoming more clear through the yoga that I was practicing and when I say yoga I mean breath and movement of course yeah, it's, yeah. it's Yoga for me is about the combination of the two. It's not just movement. It's not just a physical practice, yeah. which it was for me at the beginning. It's very much about the importance of the breath to take control of the mind. Not take control of the mind, but help control the yeah. mind better and build mental resilience. And yeah, through through a lot of yoga, it just, these different patterns that I had and different, uh, like we were talking about certain things that happen in your life through breath work, these start to come through in yoga. And in my mid to late 20s, a lot of that stuff, a lot of stuff from my childhood and late teens that I wow. just learned to bury was starting to become more and more apparent. And so get into it to kind of give a description of how it kind of helps. And for some people this is taking yeah, sure. a bit bit of a leap, but I, I had a very, my spine was injured, but also yeah. I had a very rigid spine and, and I felt it really hard uh, in, in this part of my body to kind of open it like this yeah even to the degree that when i would shave myself i hated shaving here it all felt really odd and through practicing yoga and asana and breath and and kind of opening this region of my body like the heart and the neck that actually by physically doing that and after a big practice where i would work on that area of the body a lot i really felt a lot of emotions coming up a lot of childhood memories that i'd work through so it played a massive role and, and i guess a big role in becoming more vulnerable as well but becoming more aware of certain behaviors patterns i say traumas but different things that happened to me as a kid yeah that had affected who i was today were starting to come to the surface and i, and I think yoga played a major role in in allowing that to happen for me you said it's like this part of your body so like your your neck i guess your throat mm. so is that because i know you said obviously with yogis it's like sharing stuff so is that almost like telling you you needed to like speak out about things or like why do you think it was that particular part of your body so the throat chakra I'm actually not I kind of am interested in chakras but they don't I kind of don't define yoga or don't define certain philosophies through the chakras yeah. but I think there's something interesting there but they say that if your throat chakra is blocked, blocked which is yeah. this part of your body then it, it means you're keeping things in and I definitely felt that I was a bit more like this, so even the kind of my posture. But honestly, I remember once I was in India and someone tried to shave, like on the street, I'll go to a barber and he tried to shave here and I was like this. I was tensing up so much. Yeah. But the more and more this part of my body felt open, the easier I found it to be vulnerable, to talk about things, to, you know, my parents got divorced when I was 18 and I'd kind of buried it yeah, to like yeah. 26, 27. And only like, you know, we're talking like eight, nine years later, 
did I really realize that I'd kept all these emotions in and it was only my practicing yoga and when I kind of it became more of a serious practice a few hours every day kind of thing that's when all this stuff came to the surface and I kind of start to become more aware of it different behaviors and and how it influenced yeah. who I was today yes. or at that time it's interesting because I also feel like and I remember listening to Sadhguru talking about this like the a lot of people in the west misinterpret yoga and they don't even think about the spiritual aspect of more like it's just you do these like movements and not even the breathing stuff and it's it's actually that's the big benefit is you can have almost like a spiritual awakening which is almost what happened to you in a way right yeah yeah, yeah for sure and <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the uh what i like to call lululemon <laughs> yoga where you go you stretch you get you know you sweat and a lot of yoga in London's power yoga, like power, power, power yoga, um, hot vinyasa yoga. It's kind of all these things that are built for Londoners. It's like physically very demanding. And, and to be honest, I think 90% of yoga is in London is not great. Yeah. I won't swear again on this podcast because I think people are trying to give people what they want in London. Yeah. Whilst I think yoga to get the, and sorry, you're getting physical benefits from it. Like if you were doing those classes, you're still yeah. getting, you're still building strength. You're still building flexibility. Um, you're still building spinal uh, spinal strength. So you are getting physical benefits from it. So it's not, it's not, yeah. the, it's not awful. But for me, as you're kind of saying, yoga is a mental practice. And it is, yeah. is the, it's how we can use yoga to influence our mind. Yeah. And how to be, build more re mental resilience. That's kind of what we want to be doing with yoga. And, you've got to find the right teacher that will help you get there. And like, it took me three or four years to get there of practicing yeah. a lot till I really started to understand the mental benefits of it. Yeah. So it's very much a mental practice and, and what makes it different to physical exercise, for example, is the importance placed on the breath, the inhale, the exhale, the holding of breath in certain postures as well. It's all about synchronizing breath and movement. Yeah. And that is what makes it different to physical exercise. Yeah. So a, a topic we talk about a lot on the show, you and I were just talking about this before over tea is um, obviously you can have like spiritual practice like you're talking about here with yoga. It really helped you like open up and had lots of benefits. But let's imagine, or well, not imagine you were in India for like three months doing yoga every day and you're like feeling very peaceful. Now you're living in like London, which is a very chaotic city. So how have you been able <laughs> to, I guess, like integrate more of like a spiritual life into a very like materialistic city in a way because i think that's a big theme of the cosmic bridge which is like we can all go to breath work retreats or take ayahuasca or do yoga or whatever it is but then if our lives don't change in a meaningful way when we're living in london because we're not going to move from london we've got a family here then it's kind of useless and obviously you are a father as well now so like how have you after all that work doing yoga have you continued into that life to like you know make it a long-term impact mm. yeah it's a really good question actually <laughs> when you, i know we're talking about downstairs when you're mentioning it i was, I was thinking you, you come across these the uh like super spiritual ego types who kind of do all this work on themselves and then think they're better than everyone else and it is just the complete opposite of what you're trying to do um, <laughs> but <clears throat> i i didn't get it right for many years and i say that because I'll go and spend four or five months in India, practice yeah. yoga the whole, like literally live in an ashram or practice yoga every day for three or four months, feel fucking great. And then come back to London and party for six months. <laughs> right, party for a while as well. It's very like two extremes, right? Two extremes. Yeah. It was kind of either the super healthy, just, you know, veggie, juice diet, yoga, ashram life versus partying it up in the beef with you or you know whatever it is and that wasn't healthy and I remember I saw I can't remember it wasn't a therapist but I was speaking to somebody and uh, about it and she said that life isn't black and white there yeah. are all these beautiful colors in the middle and that actually was a massive like click moment for me and, and I realized that Balance didn't mean doing one thing at the extreme, then the other thing for the extreme. Yeah. It was finding a balance of everything. So I think for me, it is really important. All the lessons that we learn through all these different spiritual practices, whether it be yoga, breath work, um, medicines as well, 
if you don't integrate it into your daily life, then why are you doing it? Yeah. And to do that, I think you just need to be aware of it. And, and I think is it important when you do go through a big moment or when you do kind of have a moment of realization, you're like how can it actually fit into my actual life? And you mentioned becoming a, a dad and I, since becoming a dad, the biggest teacher you have is your kid. Like that is bigger teacher than any medicine, any yoga or anything like that. And it teaches you so much. And patience has been my biggest lesson from, from having a kid. And I've definitely become a lot more patient. But to go back to kind of what you're saying about the integration of everything, there's no point in doing all those things if you yeah. can't integrate it into your life. And, and it's just being, it's all about awareness and yeah. also just being a bit practical about it as well I think is really important yeah she said having a child like the child and god he has an incredible daughter called Molly who's I was just saying very serene before the before the show but like having a daughter your, the, your daughter is your biggest like teacher now can you explain yeah. that more not serene at 2.30 last night <laughs> but um yeah I mean yeah when you when you become a dad you have a kid it's life changes like nothing else nothing else can come close to it at least what I've experienced in life and a kid having a kid is the hardest work you'll ever have but also enriches life in in a way like no other I don't think I really understood what pure slash unconditional like the purest form of love is I don't think I experienced until having a kid and I yeah love her to bits but it does make life tough you know you've you've got to try and balance life and that thing we we're talking about balance earlier yeah, yeah when you have a kid balance is even more important and you've got to try and balance the different important areas of your life so that is being a dad being a parent your job your relationship with your partner, your friends, your family, you, you know, as well, like actually being, make, make sure that you can work on yourself as well yeah. and do the things that are important to you. And when you have a kid, your time just goes, you have no spare time. And it's so hard to make the time to do those things, but you've got to kind of work out what the right balance is. And for me, priority number one is the kid and making sure there's enough time, enough of my time and energy goes into her and making sure that when I'm with her I'm fully present and not distracted by work because I think there's no point yeah. in creating the time to be with your kid and then just thinking oh fuck I've got this big presentation tomorrow and your mind's not there you've got to be fully present with a kid and that is I don't think I think more than anything else in life being present it's important to be present everywhere yeah and when you have a kid it teaches you the importance of it because they know they can sense if you're not fully present so I guess another lesson from Marley is just the importance of being completely present with her and just balancing all those other important areas of your life. Yeah, it's a great point actually because it's the topic of like workaholism as a parent has come up quite a few times on the podcast. Mm. And it's like you said, obviously we're living in a different era now where people can work from home or freelance and, um, you know, obviously the traditional gender role is changing slightly. But so men are probably spending more time on average with their kids. But there's also just because you're spending time with them doesn't mean you're really spending time with them and that's come up before whereas I was spending time with my kids but I'm scrolling through social media because that's my job I do social media marketing and I'm an influencer mm. and I got all this whereas actually it's like you were saying is like if you're going to spend time with your kid spend it properly right it's probably better to spend four hours a day with your kid fully present right than spending like eight hours where you're not present at all so. mm. totally and the phone is so hard like phones are just addictive nowadays and all these apps we have are yeah. just they're built for us to be addicted to them and what I try to do and I think I'm pretty good at it is just not have my phone around Molly because she can tell if I'm distracted but you know it's the day Arsenal signed Declan Rice all I want to do is you know refresh Twitter again and again and again but I know if she sees that it's the wrong thing for her to see no. and so as much as possible I try not to be on my phone and if that means me not being on my phone for 55 minutes in an hour 
and then just taking a quick break from her for five minutes and yeah. just checking my phone, my WhatsApp and Twitter or whatever, then I kind of, that is for me the way to do it. But it's just the importance of being present with your kid is is everything. Because they, mm-hmm. they are way more intuitive than us and they know if we're not present. Like we can yeah. we can fool other adults, you know. We can fool people. We can be having a conversation but thinking about what we're going to have for dinner, you know, or whatever it is or something that's going on in our life. But with your kid, they are more intuitive yeah. just because of they can't have a conversation like me and you're having a conversation. Yeah. So they pick up on other things more. And so they are, they know if we are not fully present and they will be like, why isn't daddy spending more time with me? Why is daddy not yeah. thinking about me or engaging with me? So, so yeah, you've got, you've got to be present. Kids can sense it more than ever. Just create boundaries with your phone. And it's hard. I find it hard with phones and work, but you've just got to create boundaries. Yeah. So you said so you, uh, there's a word that's come up again on the show and you mentioned it, they're boundaries. You mentioned boundaries with phone. Have you had to like set up other boundaries like since you become a since you become a father? Yeah, I it's boundaries it's something that I hadn't thought about that much until the last eighteen months or so. But I think in all parts of life, boundaries are so important and it actually allows us to protect ourselves more than anything and, and that that is the importance of setting boundaries is so we can protect yeah. ourselves we can protect our energy we can protect our time we can protect our happiness by setting up these boundaries and that might be boundaries with the part your partner yeah boundaries with your, with your kid as well do you know what i mean like i i don't want marley to uh to act a certain way around me or, or think that she can i don't know, throw food in my face for example <laughs> Not that she's actually done that, but uh, you know, other things that kids can do as, as two year olds can do. You're like, no, you can't, you can't do that. You can't treat me like that. It's like my partner Molly pulls her hair a lot, and it's like, no, you've got to set that boundary. You can't do that. Yeah. So, so boundaries are really important with your kid, with your partner, with work especially. Yeah. And this for me is where I've seen a lot of people I know struggle to set boundaries with work, and I always try to set boundaries from the beginning and I'm quite strict yeah. about my time or if I'm picking up Marley, I'll say, I can't do this now, I'm picking up Marley from nursery. Yeah. So I think the importance of setting boundaries in, in all areas of your life, but I think especially work, because I think work can creep into life and especially like you're saying, we work from home, everything's digital yeah, now, the, the kind of, those boundaries between work and life are getting more blurred now than they've ever been. And it's probably going to continue to happen like that as it just becomes easier to work on our phone or from wherever from wherever in the world. So being able to set strict boundaries with work, with your boss, with your team, with your clients are really, really important. And like I say, it just protects your energy. It protects what's important for you in your life and to make sure that I think, you know, that you can just be a, better version of yourself yeah something i was thinking about because obviously you mentioned you know yoga has been like a cosmic bridge for you is that like you could call it a boundary but more something you've you've ensured since you've been a father like you continue to do that because it's it keeps you like very sane and like aligned or so i'd actually say i haven't practiced that much yoga since marley's been born it's been one of those things that when i talked about that time balancing equation earlier stuff for myself so practicing yoga every morning that's kind of evaporated i kind of go through phases of doing a little bit but kind of then drop out of it it might be that i want an extra hour sleep in the morning it might be that i want to see marley in the morning so that's definitely something that has dropped and i felt that a lot and a lot of those mental and emotional benefits that i felt from practicing yoga on a regular basis i'm not feeling those benefits as much now and i you know one of the other things when I talk about monkey mind as well, yeah, like there's a bit of stress and anxiety as well. Like the monkey mind like loves anxiety. hundred you know? percent, yeah. And so I, I would say I was so chill and never anxious when I was practicing a lot of yoga. And now I get a little bit more anxious about things, about work or about other things as well. Mm. So I'd say that because I'm not practicing as much yoga, I'm feeling those different anxieties creeping back into my life. So yeah in, in kind of answer to your question i haven't been practicing yoga as much and i've definitely felt the detrimental effects of not practicing it as much yeah 
because I guess that's a boundary you can set for yourself like I'm 100% going to do this every day whatever happens because I know that's going to help every other part of my life right yeah for sure and I think it's about setting small goals to be able to get back to where you were so with yoga for example I was it was a very you know I say it was a mental practice but I was doing a very physically demanding style of yoga called pranavasya and it was physically and mentally demanding and that was kind of the benefits of it were so incredible for me but I could not practice it now because I'm physically not in that right shape so right now I'm I've kind of breaking it down into small bits I'm working I'm actually doing reformer pilates for a month to get my spine strong so I can then get back into the practice of yoga that I like so I feel that my spine is there so it's like I do that stage, then I get back into the yoga and I can hopefully kind of build back to where I was gradually, knowing that I'll never be able to spend two hours in the morning practicing yoga, which was what I was doing because it's impossible now, I don't have the time. But building those small blocks to getting back to where I want to be, I think is important. And like, you know, like in life and business, setting those small goals so you can achieve those yeah. bigger goals is what is important for me and what I am learning or relearning again as a dad. Yeah, hundred percent. It's like the Atomic Habits. You read that book? It's here, isn't it? Yeah, it's always to say. It's I here fancy in the studio, that, eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's basically talking about what you said. It's like you you set one goal, and then everything else. It's like a snowball effect, right? You do you set one small goal in the right mm. direction, and then suddenly the dominoes start falling. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's really important. And I was having this chat over WhatsApp today with my little cousin, and just about the importance of celebrating the little wins or even the big wins but just celebrating those little steps that you take are important otherwise you're just always chasing that next thing so I think it's important to set those small goals that add up to something bigger like James Clear is saying in Atomic (laughs) Habits which I haven't read that book but I think it is important to set those small goals but also take a moment to celebrate yourself or just be grateful to yourself for being able to do that and that yeah, is one true. thing that we talk about we a lot in your geese is, is gratitude i actually hate the word gratitude but grateful i'm all right with why do you I hate, the, I word hate gratitude, the word gratitude yeah. because i i associate it with the lululemon yoga of just <laughs> someone start i'm not gonna do an american accent but just someone starting class being saying you know you got to show gratitude for someone today that was my awful american accent the, and, the affirmations all that stuff yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. I, I i think it is important but it's just you've got it again it's about intention doing it for the right reasons and being grateful to yourself for being able to do something yeah. whether it's a small thing or a big thing I think is really important and celebrating it either with other people or for yourself as well and that you know it might be like okay I've done this yeah I'm gonna get a really nice lunch today I'm gonna just celebrate and go for a walk in the park and feel good about myself listen to some tunes in the park yeah so however you want to celebrate but celebrating being grateful for different steps you make in your life are really important yeah it's an interesting thing you were saying as well when you do some of those habits which are having a positive impact on your life like giving yourself a pat on the back and the recognition because we had um a guy on the show called Kawan glover and he had basically multiple um brain surgery strokes and he was like in his early 20s at uni and then he was in loads of medical debt because he was in the US and so he had like every right to kind of like have a like victimhood type mentality and one of the things eventually he got through it because his grandma gave him the advice of to write a book and actually he Mm. ended up becoming like a coach but the reason I'm talking about this is with what the thing he said which was for me a huge takeaway from doing this podcast is he was like we often don't treat ourselves as well as we would treat a friend so So, true so he he gave the advice of like imagine you're your friend and you're giving them advice like with love give it to yourself and for me that was a really big takeaway i I thought of what you said is like often we do all these things and we don't give ourselves credit for what we've done right yeah it's wild i we don't and i was having this chat with my partner um was it yesterday or the day before yesterday and I, I get into this habit of when I get back into wanting to exercise or do something, I would just go full power yeah. and I would then get injured after two days and I'll have a slight injury and I'd be like, no, push through it. And if it was someone else and they said, yeah, my back's hurting, I'd be like, don't go to that class. Just be kind to yourself. Give yourself a, you know, a couple of days off. But to me, I'm like, no, push through it. 
I just, you know, the, the back shouldn't be feeling like this, just push through it, it'll be all right. And then I do, and then I injure myself. And I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, I'm here again. And we just don't show ourselves enough love. It's so true yeah. what you're saying that person said. We never treat ourselves how we would treat others or close mates yeah. or family members. And it's really important to do that. And to be honest, I think as a man, it's, it's hard to love yourself because then you kind of have to have weird conversations with yourself <laughs> where you kind of have to think about the good things that you've done and yeah. either whether that's through journaling where you're celebrating achievements or who you are as well and yeah. I've been like oh no I do like this version of me I am a good person I like how I feel and I like how I make other people feel and we do we just don't do that and I think it is really hard to love yourself because it is again being really vulnerable and it's hard it's almost like that's one of the hardest ways to be vulnerable yeah. is to be completely vulnerable with yourself yeah um i also think going into like your topic of like men's mental health and why men i also think and again you can tell me if i'm wrong on this but maybe yeah. one of the reasons you set out the show is you know even though like gender roles are train changing it's still in most relationships around the world still the man is often the provider and when you're in that situation when you've got to look after kids look after your partner look after like wider family often you don't even have time to think about yourself so maybe that's why men like bury stuff because they're like they've got so many other things to worry about they're like oh i'm the last person i'm ever going to worry about but obviously that self-love is so important because if you don't give it to yourself that's when you end up you know getting in such a spiral you can commit suicide or like terrible things can mm. happen oh. yeah it's so true if we're not in a good place if one if you if we're not in a good place it's hard to show up in other areas of your life. So it's really important to kind of fill up the Mikey energy, fill up kind of like the Mikey joy. So you can be in your relationship better in your relationship, better with your kid, better in your job. Yeah. All those things that you're talking about, those pressures, those kind of life pressures, or as we were saying earlier, a lot of that is adulting. <laughs> you know, and adulting is fucking hard. Gee, like, yeah, adulting is hard. You know, we, and there are a lot of pressures that we take on, and especially a lot of those things that we take on as men. Yeah. And when it happens, those those stereotypes, which they are stereotypes, but it is usually what happens. The man normally becomes a provider, and I still think where we're at in society nowadays, it is still kind of expected that the man will provide more yeah. for the family, that the man is more the protector. Yeah. And I think they they do add pressure onto our lives and i'm feeling that pressure a lot at the moment as well or to a fair degree as well at the moment and it's something that i think we do absorb naturally as men yeah but like we were saying earlier just have a chat with someone else i, I a few of our friends like we all became dads at a similar time you know i've got a dad's yeah. whatsapp group with six of us and we can literally just even just say on the whatsapp group we're like for, for, you know for, this is happening and it's really hard. And even just voicing that and hearing them going through it or just having a chat with another yeah. dad and just being like, yeah, life is hard. Like I'm hardly seeing mates at the moment. So I think as long as, like you're saying, we will be feeling these pressures and as long as we're finding the space to be able to talk about it and just even if it's just venting, you know, yeah. then it's fine and it's easier to process because there will always be challenges in life. Life isn't, easy you know yeah there will always be challenges especially as we adult more <laughs> yeah you've got to find people you can talk through to help you yeah 100%. help each other push through those moments in life and i mean taking it back to what we talked about at the start of the show with oversharing what mm. you talked about was actually the perfect example of like yeah not over sharing in a really constructive way which is, mm. which is you've got a group of mates, right? I think I know who you're talking about as well. You all become dads at the same time. You're yeah. all going through the struggle, which is you go through one of the most beautiful things ever, but one of the most difficult things ever. Yeah. And you talk to each other and that's super constructive, right? So I think that's a really good example of men speaking out, but like in a really positive way to help each other. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to the dad's WhatsApp group. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really helpful. And sometimes it's, big things sometimes it's small things sometimes it's you know my two-year-old's having a tantrum and it's driving me nuts sometimes it's a funny story about <laughs> a traveling journey where you know the kid is you know 
pooed all the nappies they had possible and it's a, but just like being able to share these things just make it easier because it's that thing again that we talked about that I talked about with your geese is yeah knowing other people are going through something that is similar to you does make it easier and the classic thing of a problem shared is a problem halved and it is that kind of whole dynamic yeah. of being able to share stuff with other people it's kind of like you know you're going through it together so it feels easier like you've got that support yeah. from your friends that it just takes that weight off your shoulder and makes life challenges just a little bit easier yeah yeah 100 percent. the analogy which you gave earlier which i liked about like filling up your cup so like with batteries like on an iphone right mm. if you're at 10 percent, take a bit of time for yourself to you know do hobbies whatever yeah. enjoys you few maybe going down arsenal with your friends or whatever yeah. it is um i know another thing uh you've told me about is you get that often from like charity work and having mm. a bit of purpose with like more of like work so i don't know if you want to talk a bit more about that yeah one of the best ways to to fill that energy cup and that joy cup is football for me and generally going as an arsenal fan to to white Hart lane the <laughs> toilet bowl and winning i I get so much from that. Generally, for the next two weeks, I'm feeling just so much better about life because of that. <laughs> so that definitely fills 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 me up. Yeah. So with with the like you're saying with the charity work, I think it's something that's always been important because it's been something that my dad has done since I was a teenager. And I've uh, you talk about it a lot that there's this. Uh, there's this collective energy like we share yeah. you know a shared consciousness whatever you want to call it but we are yeah. all connected and i think looking after other people is really important i think you can it can make you feel better as well i you know i think you, you give for different reasons that not just money but time as well yeah. volunteers you give for different reasons one to feel good about the cause one to feel good about yourself there's a third reason that some people do as well and that's to you know look good to other people as well but to give is is something that I think is really important. You know, if we're using the cup analogy, we should fill some of our cup into other people's our energy cup. Yeah. We should fill some of that into people who are depleted, people who have less True. than us. Yeah. And so it's been really important. And and after I I was in advertising for five or six years, took a break, career break, went traveling, practiced a lot of yoga, came back and worked for a tech for good company. And I'd always been involved in charities before as an advisor even I was actually speaking with one of our friends when I was 15 volunteered quite a bit and I always got a lot from it and helping other people and that connection with people and I think it's really important I a lot of us in our jobs today we feel that we lack purpose yeah and I think what's important is when it comes to purpose you don't necessarily need a job that has a purpose to make the world a better place but you do need to find that purpose in other areas of your life. And I think it is yeah. important to try and find that. I think there's this, a friend wrote a book about this, the purpose myth that we have to all be in jobs that is for the greater good. Yeah. But actually, if you find that in other areas of your life, it might be a side hustle, it might be something else. It's, but it is really important to find that purpose for me because I think it fills your cup as well in, in a big way. And for me, almost as big as Arsenal getting three points from Shite Heart Lane. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's something that is, is really important to me. And, and about two years ago, founded a charity called Levels, which is around the time of the pandemic. And I had to, actually had to do a talk about it a couple of weeks ago. So we, we started this charity to help young black and racially underrepresented founders and entrepreneurs to try and take their business through the next to the next level. So we help them with mentoring as well. So matching uh, these entrepreneurs to amazing mentors, training and resources as well, and also kind of a small grant at the end to help to help boost their business. We actually recently merged with another organization that does similar work, more about helping black and racially underrepresented young people find guidance and career support as well. And it's something that I don't get paid for, but I just get so much from it and I think it is our duty all of us who have a little bit more is our duty to give back in some way and that doesn't always mean money I think people always think that that means money it doesn't it yeah. can mean time time is more valuable than money like I was saying True. earlier I have no time time is way more valuable than money for me and I think for a lot of people time is more valuable than money so just being able to give 
is important. Well, it's like what you're saying about being present, not just with your kid, but with anyone. That's basically a time mm. thing. It's like, I want you to give me your time and not give me your time in a false way. Give me your time in a genuine way because not all one minutes are different. If you're having a conversation and like playing with Marley and she's smiling at you versus you're scrolling through your phone, those are very different like minutes. Technically, they're the same, but they're not the same, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's If we were having this conversation now and neither of us were present, we would not be having a conversation like this. We yeah. would be scattered. So yeah, the importance of being present yeah. in all areas of your life is, is important. There's somewhere it's even more important. But yeah, you've, you've got to be present. You've got to show up. Yeah. Otherwise you, you're, yeah, you're not there. And we've, you've, I've talked about this with you because you started your podcast before me and that's often why the in-person things work better mm. because you can be more present, right? Versus mm. on Zoom, it's a lot easier to like scroll to another tab and actually the yeah. person, you think they're there, but they're not really there, right? Yeah, yeah, Zoom is so hard for that. And it is harder to pay. Uh, studies have shown that it is more tiring being on a Zoom call than face to face. Because yeah. when I'm with you here, I can pick up on all kind of the subtle things that are going on. Yeah. So I'm reading the room better. I'm reading how you're perceiving me. I'm reading how you're taking in some of the things that I'm saying. Over Zoom, we can't do that. Our brain isn't yeah, yeah. used to doing that. So it uses up so much more energy. And yeah be, being present in person and that's why we talked about those different things about if you want to be vulnerable with someone definitely in person is easier for that yeah. go for a walk in a park with someone it's always easier um yeah really important i think i saw microsoft teams which is similar to zoom they did a study and it showed um like 70 percent of people when they're on a team school that they're actually not on the, <laughs> yeah. looking at the person they're in like a different yeah, tab, video off yeah which is which is absolutely mental um so there's a, there's a question i usually ask to like close the show i used to ask it in quite a generic way which is like what advice would you give to your younger self now what i try to do is go to a specific point in your life so i'm going to say maybe this is selfish because this may happen to me at some point but like as you said parenting can be very difficult mm. right so what advice would you give to yourself maybe like two months after molly's born and i know those initial months are very difficult a lot of lack of sleep um you've got to be like very alert so yeah someone uh, there's maybe people listening to it who are in that situation but yeah um those initial initial months when you first became a parent that's a really good question. <laughs> and I've been trying to think of the right answer as you're asking the question. I think, and I'm going to say this from a dad's perspective, so from my own perspective, a baby grows for nine months in a woman's body. Yeah. Right? That's nine months where they're feeling, they, that connection is growing and growing between baby and mother. As a man, you can do it when the when when the kid's in in the tummy, so to speak. Yeah, you can do that. You can speak to it. You can you know, stroke it. But but it's way harder to feel that connection from the off. So I would say I, I loved Marley as soon as she was born, but it took about four or five months for it to become the purest form of love and to feel so deeply connected to one other human being. So I would say to a two month year old, to a dad who has a two month year old, I would say keep investing in that connection. It's gonna click soon and it's gonna feel amazing and grow stronger and stronger and stronger. So I think people don't talk about it enough because you, you are not, not this competition, you are nine months behind mum in terms of connection. And you, yeah. like I say, kid is born, you feel the love, but it takes, what took me about five or six, four, five, six months for it to become just so pure and so strong. Yeah. So that's the advice I'd give to a to a dad who had a two month old. Because I also imagine it's the trust from the baby side as well with you, because as you said, the mum's got that connection for nine months, but then it's they're taking time to warm up to you as well as you, you to them, right? That's yeah, and, and they, even from the beginning, you know, you do skin to skin in the first couple months and you feel that connection. It's, it's not like, you, it's it's a cold relationship. Yeah. You, you feel so much love, but it just jumps up a level after, I can't remember the exact time, four, five, six months. It just, yeah. it goes up to just this complete purest form of love that is just the most amazing and enriching thing in life amazing well yeah we're going to put a link to all the yogi stuff in the the show notes is there anything any resources in particular yogis you'd like to send people to i think 
all the pods so the yogis podcast they all have different uh titles so see if anything resonates with you and have a listen i would also say the other organization i talked about 2020 levels we're always looking for mentors amazing mentors for entrepreneurs and, and young people so if you are interested please drop me a le- uh drop me a message at nick at 2020 we'll put it in the show notes i'll actually send them to the website but, but yeah if anyone's interested in becoming a mentor then that would be really great as well awesome and in terms of the takeaways for the show i thought i'd come back to you actually because i was when we were talking about um you know sharing what's the right way to share and how to share if you're like going through something i think you mentioned like two main points or three main mm. points what was that two two main points i'll make yeah. sure i remember them this time <laughs> first is find the right space yeah and that is the environment that is the person that is the time that is your surrounding so find the right space is really important a space that you feel comfortable in comfortable with yeah. your surroundings not watching football with the lads he said so. <laughs> yeah not what you know not 80th minute of a, <laughs> yeah. a one or game when everyone's watching Goldie's not going to be present in that moment yeah, yeah I'm fully immersed in Arsenal I, I unfortunately won't give a shit about anything else you're saying so I would say yeah space number one and what space means within that and number two just start talking let it flow as soon as you start starting is the hardest thing yeah. but as soon as you start it will just be easy and it will come easier and easier to talk, to talk and talk. Amazing. Love it. Well, thanks a lot for coming on, mate. I've enjoyed it a lot. It's been really good to be here. Yeah, 100%. Thank you. And uh, yeah, if there's anyone who's going through or maybe someone who you feel like is going through something but they won't talk about it, send them this show because I think uh, Nick gave some really great takeaways. Subscribe to us on YouTube across podcast platforms and we'll see you next week.